It's a gold mine, this little chunk of meteorite which fell on Australia last year. For the past six months, they've been taking it apart and have discovered it contains amino acids, the building blocks of life, and found them in combinations that seem to prove they were there before this tiny piece of asteroid hit the Earth. But this discovery does suggest that life elsewhere in the universe is now a good deal more than just a mathematical possibility. Richard Threlkeld, CBS News, at the Ames Research Laboratory in California. Perhaps life on Earth was the most impossible fluke, never to be repeated in the infinity of space. But on the balance of evidence, one conclusion emerges. It will happen elsewhere, consistent with, with, with environments. It seems that if it's rapid on the Earth, it should be rapid wherever the conditions are the same. Conditions could have been the same on other planets billions of years before the birth of the Earth which is a relative latecomer to the cosmic scene. The universe could be teeming with life, far more advanced than our own. Regardless of the head start life might have got elsewhere, for the first time on Earth, there is a technological intelligence reaching for the stars. For the first time ever, we have assembled virtually all the space professionals from the Earth's space-faring nations. This is indeed an, an unprecedented a gathering of world space leaders. Engineering and science have taken us into the frontiers of space. Linking us to life amongst the stars calls for a similar effort. 1992 was International Space Year. It also became the year that NASA launched its massive new search for extraterrestrial intelligence. In the first few minutes of our search, we will have covered more astronomical territory than all 60 previous searches over the past 30 years combined. So it's millions of times more powerful. In its hunt for an alien message, this silicon machinery will sift automatically through the entire 10 billion channels of the microwave window. Mostly, it will hear the random crackle of the universe or the annoying chatter of earthly radio interference. But what is programmed to pick out is that one telltale blip of a deliberate signal. And maybe you can talk to me a little bit about what I'm seeing here. This is, uh, Working out how to find an invisible signal in a sea of noise was the perfect challenge for Kent Colors. Blind since birth, his task was to guide the computers to that one message floating in an overwhelming tide of data. The software and, and hardware that I designed is looking for something that is not random noise. The way you can imagine this is to have, to have an analogy between our radio listening and reading a lot. The amount that you would read is about one Encyclopedia Britannica per second. Now, you know, not one crummy volume, but the whole thing. And you read that every second, and it's filled with random letters, typically, which are the star noise. And what you're looking for is that one sentence that says, hi there, we're the extraterrestrial guys. This is a NASA mission with a difference. All done from Earth, but with equipment which can be moved worldwide. Armed with advanced alien receivers and a conviction that life is widespread, Planet Earth's search for extraterrestrial intelligence is all systems go.
next destination for the Mobile Research Facility is the Caribbean island of Puerto Rico and the Arecibo Observatory. It's at Arecibo that one half of NASA's new two-part initiative began on October the 12th, 1992. This is where the targeted search will home in on stars like the Sun, which may have planets like the Earth. Hey, lights. I think one and two are cable one. What's that? Three and four. Three and four are cable two. That's what I just said. Here we go, red. Red, green, green blue. blue. And it's dark. Good, we have a, a virtual terminal. Root file system is good. FS clean. Clean, we're coming up. All right, hey, this is good, hey, this is right. good. From this radio telescope, the largest and most sensitive in the world, those stars nearest the Earth will be precisely targeted and painstakingly interrogated for broadcasts or for signals leaking from their planets. But this targeted approach will only be able to eavesdrop on about a thousand stars this closely. To reach beyond those thousand stars, NASA is employing a second strategy, an all-sky survey. This is looking out for stronger signals or deliberate beacons coming from the myriad stars further away. Initial deployment is at the Goldstone Deep Space Tracking Facility in the Mojave Desert. The uh, NASA All-Sky Survey will systematically search the entire sky, both in northern and southern hemispheres, and uh, sort of make a mosaic of the sky at different frequency bands, searching over tens of millions of frequencies every second. Goldstone and Arecibo are only the beginning. Before the search is out, radio telescopes around the globe will have tried to pluck a mystery signal from the stars. We want to go to 8429.6 megahertz. OK. The all-sky survey alone will consume over six years of continuous telescope operating time, a point not lost on critics of the NASA SETI program, who see waiting for a call from ET as a frivolous waste of resources. Right now, we're expending something in the order of $10 million a year, and that's going into salaries. That's going into developing technology, it's going into developing educational tools, and it's going into doing very good science. And I believe what we're doing with that money is investing it in our future. I think that we are developing future engineers, we're developing uh, awareness of humankind, and we're learning something about, we're gaining perspective about what we as human beings, what is life, what is the role of life in the galaxy in particular, what is our role as human life? What is our future? And I think that's what we're studying. Perhaps sometime between now and the year 2001, NASA's scientific odyssey will have answered these questions. What if we do receive a message? To begin with, we'll know very little about it. If we receive it, we will not understand what we're getting. But we'll have an unmistakable signal, full of structure, full of challenge. The best people will try to decode it. And that's easy to do because those who have constructed it will have made it easy to decode. Otherwise, no point. This is, as I have tried to say, this is anti-cryptography. I want to make a message which you, who have never got in touch with any symbols of mine, no key, no clue, nevertheless, you'll be able to read it. It means I have to fill it full of clues and unmistakable, clever devices to make it readable. And I think they will have done that. But it'll still take a long time to collect enough message so we can 
decoded. It's a gigantic thing we're talking about, getting into a civilization greater than our own, very surely, older and more elaborate and so on, and trying to reach it on one single thin channel of radio in which we have nothing in common with those people except this radio channel. Reports are coming in from all over the empire, from all over the world. The government has not yet issued any statement, but there seems to be no question. Whatever it is, it's something real. You'll know. We'll tell you. We'll tell everybody, and we'll make the data available uh, to anyone who wants to analyze it, because it's, it's really a fundamental principle of this project that any signal is the property of all humankind. This is Elmer Davis again. We still don't know what it is or where it comes from, but there's something there. What'll happen? Short term. Lots of excitement. Incredible excitement. The greatest news story ever. The greatest event in the history of mankind. It'll be on every newspaper, every magazine, everyone's tongue. Um, the stock market will either go up a lot or go down a lot. I don't even know which, but it'll be something dramatic. Every religion on earth will have to scramble to, to uh, rationalize its previous belief with, just, with something which is now a fact and which was previously speculation. <laughs> Call headquarters. Get the lieutenant. Whether this becomes the day the Earth stands still, or the day it goes into a flat spin, will depend on how well we are prepared to deal with it. With this in mind, astronomers have prepared a procedure to follow, a declaration of principles, which, among other things, calls for the notification of the United Nations. After the initial bombshell, there comes this period in which it recedes into the back pages, but at the same time, it's soaking into people's consciousness. You can't do anything after that without somehow being aware that there's those folks up there. You can't make major decisions about uh, resources on Earth, about fighting wars, about nuclear weapons, without thinking, you know, we're in charge of this planet, but we're not the only life. There's those guys up there, and what about them? What about them? They're certainly smart, but are they peaceful or aggressive? Should we answer back? Well, I would respond immediately if I got a, a signal, but I'm not the only one whose judgment is, uh, will be called upon. I think the, the, the problem, of, the question of responding will probably have to be argued out interminably and will be. Oh, yes, I think you've got to take the risk. Humans have always lived dangerously, and if that happened, it would be a great shot, and people should have a go at it. I think I would trust any random form of life more than I trust humans. You certainly want to wait until you've understood the contents of the message, and you have something to say back to them. You just don't go transmitting because you want to shoot your mouth off. You'll feel really silly about the things you told them, and even sillier about the things you asked them if you haven't gone to the trouble to read your mail first. But there are a few very eminent scientists who believe we shouldn't be searching for this interstellar mail. That contact with a greatly advanced civilization would be more than human society could cope with. Some fear more serious implications. When the first pulsar signals were picked up at Cambridge, the British Astronomer Royal, Sir Martin Ryle, became most concerned. Well, Martin Ryle was, was head of the group, and uh, one of his ideas was that if my observations should confirm that it probably was uh, extraterrestrial intelligence, then we should perhaps forget the... Uh, forget we'd ever made the measurements and throw it all away, because... Um, it's really a dangerous situation. I mean, here we are, a fairly primitive civilization. If we let the uh, aliens know that we're here by sending a signal back in some kind, then, of course, it, it might be that those aliens are just looking for this because they want a, a, a relatively uninhabited planet to move into. And in the history, at least, of our own planet, primitive peoples being discovered by uh, more advanced ones usually have a bad time. And I think Martin R Ryle imagined that perhaps that would happen to us. It's not nice to be invaded by aliens.
it happened when the Spanish and French and British colonized North America. It happened when the British colonized Australia. It happened when the Spanish and Portuguese colonized South America. If any intelligent beings in outer space ever got these messages, they would come here and do to us what the Spanish conquistadors did to Atahualpa, the Inca emperor, when Atahualpa told the Spaniards, there's gold in Cuzco, and here's how you get to Cuzco, and here are some guys for the journey. It was suicidal on the part of Atahualpa. It's also suicidal on the part of the radio astronomers.